So, uh, if you recollect we were looking at single sideband modulation yesterday and we learned how to demodulate a single sideband signal. We also learned how to generate a side single sideband signal using either the uh, sideband filtering method or the phasing method right. And the phasing method was based on a new representation of the single sideband signal that we discussed which involved the message signal empty, the carrier cosine omega C t and the quadrature carrier sin omega C t along with the Hilbert transform of the message signal right. So, that representation also led us to an alternative method for generating SSP signals right. Now, we were also looking at the demodulation and in the when we discussing the demodulation we found that the demodulated signal when you do coherent detection is given by in the in the presence of let us say lack of synchronization between the local carrier and the incoming signal incoming carrier your demodulated signal would be would consist of a component due to empty plus a component also due to m hat t right. So, unless theta t is 0 this would lead to severe distortion right in the recovered message signal. If theta t is not 0 right. So, this is one small problem that we faced uh, in the demodulation process in this case. Of course, if there is perfect synchronization there is no problem. There is a second method for demodulation of SSP signals and that is called the carrier reinsertion method. This also requires a local carrier like the coherent demodulator, uh, the standard coherent demodulator, but has the has some uh, minor advantages over that in terms of uh, practical implementation right. Uh, basically here what we do is take the incoming modulated signal and instead of multiplying this with the carrier local carrier we simply add it with the local carrier. So, you have a local carrier and you add local carrier to the incoming signal and what do you think you will get now? Well, we will see that if it is not obvious. We will get a signal whose envelope approximately under certain conditions follows the envelope of the message signal right. Now, it is not obvious at all we will we'll see how it becomes so and if this is indeed so what we can do is follow this up with the envelope detector. <laughs> to produce your detected output demodulated output y sub d t ok. To see what happens let us consider the signal E t at the output of this adder. What does it look like? It contains the SSB signal coming in plus the local carrier right. So, the SSB signal coming in and the local carrier if you do that uh, if you remember x of t is m t cosine omega c t plus m hat t sin omega c t right <laughs> and you also have k cosine omega c t added to that. So, the cosine omega c t has two parts now the in phase part of the SSP signal was half a c m t right 
this was multiplying cosine omega CD plus you have a constant amplitude carrier K here and these two together now constitute the so called in phase part of the SSB signal and what is the quadrature phase part? Well, depending on whether it is lower sideband, upper side or upper sideband, we will have half AC m hat t into sin omega c d. Okay. One of the very nice advantages of a quadrature representation of this kind, remember we have discussed this quadrature representation for arbitrary narrow band signals and it is interesting to see that the various kinds of AM signals that we have discussed, each of them fall into this representation, right. For example, the DSPSC signal has only one part, the in phase part, right, half AC MT cosine omega C D, right, whereas the, DS, uh, the, the single sideband signal has both the in phase part as well as the quadrature part, phase part in which the quadrature phase part is the Hilbert transform of MT, right. So, this falls in the general class, I mean th this is in conformity with the, our discussion on the general representation of bandpass signals, which has an in phase part and a quadrature <coughs> phase part. Okay. Only thing is that there is a special relationship for the in phase between the in phase and quadrature phase parts for it to become an SSP signal, right, that we have understood now. Now, one of the advantages of this representation is that you can easily identify what the envelope of the signal will be. By writing this expression, if you remember what is the definition of the envelope, now the basic definition of the envelope was that we wanted to find out it is a trace of the positive peaks of the carrier, right. So, to understand how we can identify the envelope, if we, uh, one can rewrite this as an amplitude part RT which is always positive into if cosine omega C t plus a phase part theta t. <coughs> this signal can always be written in this form using trigonometric identities, right. For example, what will be R t? If you want to write this expression in this form, what would be the value of R of t? It will be the square root of the square of this plus the square of this. Right, and that becomes your envelope. What will be the value of theta t? It will be the tan inverse of this upon this, right. So, here R, R t is square root of uh, half a, a sub c m t plus k whole square plus half a sub c m hat t whole square and theta of t is tan <coughs> inverse of half m t plus k of a c a sub c m t plus k upon half a c m hat t. <coughs> Inverse of this? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Right. So, you can make this caught inverse. So, the diode in the RC circuit which we use for demodulation, sir, even there we used to get the envelope. No, I think you are not understanding the point that I am making. We are now looking at the envelope of this signal, right. The envelope detector will be the same. The envelope detector will remain the same, the diode detector, but we are not discussing the envelope detector here. We are trying to understand the nature of E t, right, that is our concern here. That is right, but please give me some time to explain how it is coming back, right. I am just explaining that. <coughs> give me time, right. In any case, theta t is not relevant here, we are only looking at the envelope, right. 
So now let's look at this envelope. Let me complete my discussion. Then I'll take a question from you. Is there a mistake I'm making? No, sir. Uh, the initial part we are adding cos k cos omega ct, right? Uh, and that is at the receiver, right? Uh, uh, and how are we generating this uh, signal? A, the cosine omega ct? No, sir. The um, exactly the same because it should have a phase difference also. I'll come back to this point. That's a that's a good question. The question is. Um, we are not really, it appears totally avoided the phase coherence issue, right. We are adding a local carrier which is adding up to the cosine omega ct part of the incoming signal, right, which essentially means that you require a phase coherence, right. So that, that issue remains to be discussed and we will certainly come back to it. But first let us see how does it help us, right. So surely that is a relevant question to ask, okay. So now let us look at this expression, expression for the envelope. I would like the envelope to follow the message signal. Can I make some assumptions which will make it so? Under what conditions will RT approximately fo uh, follow MT? When K is very large, correct. So that is precisely what we will do. We will choose our carri local carrier to be added in sufficiently large quantity, with sufficiently large amplitude so that this term dominates over the second term, so that this can be ignored in this squaring and square rooting process, right. So if, if we make the assumption that half AC MT plus K is much greater for all time than half AC M hat T, which can be easily done by choosing K to be a sufficiently large constant, right, with respect to these other signals then we can approximate r of t as equal to half ac m of t plus a constant k right and therefore if you ignore this constant we got an envelope which is proportional to the message signal empty right and therefore our envelope detector in that condition would produce an output proportional to empty you agree with that? If the envelope follows the message, the envelope detector obviously would produce an output which is proportional to the envelope. Sir. Yes, please. Sir, in case MP is a cosine signal or sine signal, simply uh, half M AC square would be left because MT had to be signing on cosine. Whatever MT may be, it will be cosine omega, it will not be cosine omega CT, it will be cosine omega MT to be low frequency signal. But sir, same way M had T, so it both be cancelled and sine square and cosine. No, uh, if you look at this total expression, this total expression is always going to be much larger than this, right? That's what we. That is the assumption we are making, right? So I think there is no need to bring in that issue at all, right? This will be still valid, whatever the method signal <laughs> empty may be, right? It will be still valid. So the envelope will follow this. So. Therefore, this gives you an alternative method for demodulating SSP signals. Now, that issue that was raised a couple of minutes ago, excuse me, the issue that was raised a couple of minutes ago about the phase coherence of the uh, local carrier in this case, right? That is true. Even in this situation, we would require the local carrier. to be in phase and frequency synchronism. However, even though that is so, it is easier to manage than the um, local oscillator which, which mixes the two signals, right. It is easier to manage in the following way, in the following uh, manner that at least for applications like speech for example, right. One can adjust this phase and frequency manually in this case till you get in your uh, distortion removed and your intelligence. The, it is not as sensitive as it is in uh, as the other case is, as the coherent demodulator is, right. So one can manually 
just like you are tuning the you know receiver you can tune the receiver exactly to have a phase and frequency uh, synchronism and get till you get your speech quality back right it's easy to do it in this case than in the other case right and therefore this is preferred over that system right but your your question is very much valid but this is the answer to that question right so the local carrier frequency let's say the frequency and phase in this case can be manually tuned to get the right quality of empty and this is particularly doable when empty happens to be signal which you can hear right like speech or music particularly speech one does not use SSB for music ever right. So, typically for speech till you get your quality back and the intelligibility is good you can keep on tuning it. That is what I am saying theoretically it can be done, but that is a much more difficult thing to do than in this case right. This is in, in other words if you do this uh, do some uh, analysis you will find that this is less sensitive to uh, the phase and frequency errors than the other system is right. I am not doing that analysis here. But uh, there a slight <laughs> phase offset will completely uh, start uh, distorting your signal because of the multiplication with the terms cosine theta t and sine theta t right. Here it will not be as sensitive as it, it, as it is in that case right. So, that is something that, that uh, is known by experience as, all, uh, as also it can be shown by analysis. So, see if you can work out what is the sensitivity of this new modulation to theta t right. If you just attempt to do that and see what kind of conclusions you can reach um, you will probably start agreeing with this right. But if necessary we will uh, take it up in our tutorial. But at the moment I will just make the statement that this happens to be the case that it is easy to at least tune it manually for applications like speech, speech transmission right. Okay, so that is about single sideband modulation. Single sideband modulation is good if you want to save bandwidth. It is a little more um, tricky to demodulate like we just seen right, but it is uh, you know these complexities uh, one ignores if bandwidth is of very major concern to us right. We want to save bandwidth we will live with the complexity right. Uh, we will try to do whatever is required to make the receiver working very well, but if the receiver happens to happens to become very complex in the process we do not mind right because bandwidth is important it is an important resource for us. Sir, yes please. Right, what is the carrier like that also we are having the same bandwidth. So, there are two different ways of saving bandwidth right they are equivalent ways depending on the application you will choose one or the other right. So, if you, if you have the application where you would like to actually transmit two messages on the same carrier quadrature multiplexing is a good alternative right. If on the other hand <laughs> you are transmitting a large number of messages um, uh, maybe in the in the same overall frequency band it is much more convenient to put each of them uh, put put the single sideband modulation use single sideband modulation and put them in a large number of adjacent sidebands because the quadrature multiplexing can handle only two signals right. If you want to handle more than two signals that philosophy will not be working will not be useful directly for multiplexing. Of course, you can do quadrature multiplexing in each band which is twice the single side band that also can be done. So, there are various alternatives which are possible right. We, just we have a number of techniques available which technique you actually adopt will depend on the application right. We will consider some applications where frequency division multiplexing will enable us to put a large number of messages in adjacent sidebands right and we will use a single sideband modulation right. But before coming to that let, uh, let me discuss one more kind of amplitude modulation which is very very pertinent um, in the context of suppressed sideband modulations okay. Now, let us discuss the motivation for that first the, uh, the this new 
modulation that I'm going to discuss now, if I if you remember, I classified the suppressed sideband modulations into two types: the single sideband modulations and the next one, which was vestigial sideband modulation. So I like to discuss this a little bit. First the motivation, why do we need such a thing before even telling you what it is. The need is as follows, single sideband modulation saves us bandwidth that is well understood. It is, it how, however has one problem, suppose we already know that your, we already know that your single sideband modulation is difficult to generate because it either requires us to have very sharp cutoff filters in the frequency domain right at the around the carrier frequency or else you require equally uh, slightly less difficult but still difficult problem of realizing the wideband Hilbert transformer at baseband right. These are the two ways by which SSP can be generated. Now when you try to do a sharp cutoff filtering at the carrier frequency right I do not know whether you have been involved in some filter designs. Um, you know typically the uh, amplitude characteristics are best in the middle of the band of any filter. Similarly the phase characteristics are also best in the middle of the band, but the moment you deviate from the band typical filter real, uh, filters that you will realize or synthesize or make will start to develop a non ideal characteristics when, uh, when you go away from the center of the band. So around the edge of the band you will have both nonlinear phase characteristics as well as maybe not very uh, nice amplitude characteristics right. If, if, if instead of remaining absolutely constant of course they will have some oscillatory behavior or the phase characteristics will become nonlinear at that time right. And so if, 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 if your basic signal message signal has a significant amount of low frequency component right. You understand I am talking about the baseband signal. If you have a significant amount of low frequency component in your message signal, where will it go after DSBSC modulation? It will go around FC that significant frequency, uh, frequency uh, significant energy content at low frequencies would translate to significant energy component energy content at around the carrier frequency. So now if you have a sharp cutoff there and that sharp cutoff is associated with these problems, it will definitely distort the low frequency components of your message signal because that is going to get affected by the cutoff characteristics near the FC, near the carrier frequency. So let me maybe illustrate by a picture. So let us say your message band message signal spectrum looks like this right and ideally if you had a sharp cutoff filter like that if you want to remove the lower side band no problem if you can do that. But this is precisely the problem I cannot do that right. Typically what will tend to happen is that I might get you know even if it is a good filter it might be like that in that as far as amplitude characteristics are concerned right. And the phase characteristics uh, perhaps in this area would be highly nonlinear because the and the sharper the cutoff, the more nonlinear it tends to become, right. So, phase characteristics will tend to become highly nonlinear, which will imply some kind of a delay distortion or phase distortion of the mess of the low frequency components of the message signal. Why low frequency? Because these these frequency components actually belong to the low frequency component of your original message signal, right. So, if your message signal has significant low frequency content right then SSB will create all these problems for us because of the need for sharp cutoff which we if we either we cannot do it or if we can do it it will be associated with these kinds of distortions. For certain kinds of signals this is not a serious issue for example for speed signals we know that the low frequency content is not that high. I discussed with you some time ago at the beginning of this course that speed signal has significant content from 
let us say 300 hertz onwards right it practically has no content between 0 to 300 hertz right. So, in that kind of a signal the spectrum after frequency translation would perhaps look like that right there is a band here in which there is no signal energy right and that gives me flexibility in designing this filter the filter design can be done I do not need a, a really really sharp cut off filter I mean in the sense of a brick wall characteristic there is a there is a band available over which I can gradually roll off the characteristics of the cut off filter side band filter right which is not going to be available to me if this band was not available to me right you appreciate this point. So, in certain kind and also this is a second point as we discussed earlier speech is a kind of signal in which even if some phase distortion occurs it does not matter very much why because our ears are insensitive to phase distortion the way the ear perceives speech it is phase distortion or delay distortion is not very crucial right. So, therefore, for speech applications SSB is quite ok SSB is doable right. In fact, in speech applications it is widely used single sideband modulation. However, there are certain kinds of signals which have a lot of low frequency content right and which are sensitive to phase distortion and one of one such set of signals is a picture signal I mentioned to you right. So, um, so you have picture signals you have uh, facsimile signals which are also kind of picture signals you are scanning the uh, in content of a page right. So, all these signals are very sensitive to phase distortion which will occur if you try to implement an SSP modulator right. For and at the same time such signals have very large bandwidth for example, a picture signal has a bandwidth of the order of 5 megahertz we discussed that 4 to 5 megahertz and there is a therefore, a very strong case for saving bandwidth right. The voice signal after all uses only 4 kilohertz bandwidth right. So, while there is a need to save bandwidth if you want to transmit a large number of voice signals even one picture signal alone will consume if you were to allow DSBSC 10 megahertz of bandwidth. 5 megahertz on either side right. So, there is a very strong need a very strong case for saving bandwidth here at the same time we find that SSP kind of saving will not help because it will create undesirable distortions. So, this is the motivation to look for something different ok and that is the motivation for vestigial side band modulation is that ok. So, basically what let me summarize what I have said what we have said is that SSP is suitable and implementable <coughs> for what kind of messages for those messages which have relatively less energy content at low frequencies right for messages let us say with little low frequency and content because if that is the case the separation of the side bands separation of the upper side band from the lower side band or, or vice versa becomes easy to do hmm? make separation of side bands possible this feature of this message signal makes the separation of the two side bands feasible or possible. Right? I have explained this I hope you have understand this now I am just summarizing. On the other hand message signals having large bandwidth and significant low frequency component content exist like the TV signal, the video signals, the fax signals etcetera, the data signals right. 
all these kinds of signals they they have significant low frequency content. So, this separation becomes more difficult and if you try to enforce it it will create all kinds of distortions which are not acceptable okay. and it is for such applications that one thinks of VSP. Okay. So, having motivated the need for a different modulation what is it that VSB can do which SSB cannot do which makes it uh, a, a preferred modulation for this case. Okay. The, the VSB's mod, uh, approach is like this all right I will not be able to save the entire bandwidth because of this very difficult situation that the two side bands are uh, just meshing into each other and there is no, no gap for me to design a graceful filter. So, what if I allow most of one side band and the little bit of the other so that the filter design becomes an easy job right and that is basically the idea of VSP. So, in fact that is the meaning of vestigial side band you allow most of one side band and a small portion or what is also called a vestige of the other side band right. So, if you do that our filter design requirements become much easier to handle and all those distortions that were coming because of the sharp cutoff will not happen now right. So, basically that is the idea of a vestigial sideband it retains most of one sideband and a very small portion or a trace of the other. And that permits me replacing the sharp cut off filter with a gradual roll off kind of filter gradually rolling of filter. So, what we are saying is can be pictorially expressed like this you generate your signal SH signal you do DSPSC modulation on this by multiplying this with A cosine omega CT and you have a sideband filter here, but it is not that sharp cut off filter we will call it some H sub VSBF. which will yield the VSP signal typically it will be if required also send some portion of the carrier if required, but that is not important right now right. And this H VSB F suppose we want the high uh, the upper side band it will not now be a filter which has this ideal requirement right. It will indeed allow a gradual roll off like that. So, you will be transmitting most of the side band the upper side band let us say the bandwidth is B right. So, this is F sub C this is F sub C plus B, but you are also transmitting this portion of the lower side band. It could be the other way around. You could be transmitting the lower sideband, most of the lower sideband, and a small portion of the upper sideband. It could be either, either way. Right? Of course, the similar thing will exist on the negative frequency axis. So your bandwidth will now be. Suppose basically we are going down on this side by a small amount. Your bandwidth B may be large. For example, in the TV case, it is 4 to 5 megahertz, right? 4.5 megahertz or something. There will be an overflow into the other direction by an amount, let us say, beta, right? Where beta will be typically much less than B. 
So, you will be still saving a considerable amount of bandwidth right, but you will be um, re relaxing the requirements of your sideband filter. So, your sideband filter design becomes easy right and you can now are, are any questions arising in your mind when this kind of thing is being suggested what kind of questions now arise in your mind to, to carry our, our discussion forward. Hmm? Any questions that arise? Any other? Uh, yes. The issue is, can such a signal, when uh, how how will such a signal be demodulated, and will it actually yield empty, or will it yield something else? Right? Because we have done something funny. Is uh, is this uh, is this kind of filtering acceptable? No matter what kind of filter you have here, right? Or there are some constraints, right? Well, the answer to that question is what we will now uh, try to obtain, and we will find that the principle is fine, but you have to be careful in the design of this filter if you want a demodulated signal which is proportional to empty, which is a replica of your message signal, right? So, that is what you will like to understand. How should such a filter be designed? Uh, what should be the I am not getting into filter design I am getting into the what should be the nature of the transfer function of such a filter right such that we are able to reconstruct our message signal back because that is the ultimate requirement. The two requirements one is we want to save the bandwidth which we have done right not by the whole amount of B but more or less by a fairly big amount right. For example, for the TV signals this could be let us say 500 kilohertz as compared to 4.5 megahertz this is still a good saving right and so on and so forth okay so what we like to see is what is the nature of the modulated signal xt where xt i'm defining once again to be this signal here So, we will soon see you see in, in any case it is obvious that now we can write x t in x t is a narrow band signal st still it is a band pass signal there is a center center frequency carrier frequency and um, there is a spectrum around the carrier. So, it becomes a narrow band or a band pass signal right if the carrier is large enough frequency and we know a general representation for any narrow band or any band pass signal is the in phase and quadrature phase representation right. There is an in phase component which is a low frequency signal. Uh, so, x sub i t cosine omega c t minus x sub q t sin omega c t right that quadrature representation. So, obviously, uh, the SSP signal had that representation the VSP signal also will have that representation. The only things that will change are the actual values of x sub i and x sub q the actual nature of the in phase and quadrature phase components. So, we can certainly we will be able to see that this signal that we have generated will have this form once again this carrier part which I have introduced is because we want to be able to do envelope detection in the same manner that we did for SSP right. So, this part will be the same as we have for the SSP plus of course, there is a carrier uh, that I am introducing here minus a by 2 into some low pass signal y of t sin omega c where y of t will be we will see soon will be a function of both the message signal and its Hilbert transform it will not be just the Hilbert transform of mt. Right. So, we can have this kind of a representation and if this kind of a representation is possible we can do perfect synchronous demodulation or approximate envelope demodulation right. So, first 
we will discuss how this comes and then we will discuss it. What about the transmission bandwidth? Here it will be B plus beta where beta is typically less than B some more, most of the time it is much less than B. Now demodulation is what we would like to spend some time on because that leads to some uh, crucial questions and answers. In the process we will also look at a general theory of sideband filtering which will include SSB as a special case right. So VSB is a general case and SSB becomes a special case in which beta is equal to 0 right. So we will uh, in the process also discuss a general theory of sideband filtering. And the general theory basically tries to answer the following question, right. The question is let us say I have this modulator which we have just talked about MT AC sin uh, cosine 2 pi FCT followed by a suitable band pass or high pass filter or low pass filter depending on what kind of band uh, side band you want and that gives you your modulated signal x of t right and you get this x of t here the demodulator multiplied with AC prime cosine 2 pi FCT and for demodulation what do you normally do put a low pass filter here right that is your synchronous demodulation and you will get a demodulated signal let us call it V sub OT. And the general theory that we are going to discuss addresses the following questions. Question What kind of band pass filter should I use, or what kind of high pass, low pass filter should I use at the transmitter? What kind of HF should I select so that V naught T is <coughs> proportional to MT? Right? Because we are suggesting some rather complicated filtering here, right, in the VSB case. So what kind of filter transfer function should be, should this be suppose you want the upper side band so maybe let us say this could be a, a high pass filter but any high pass filter or with some, some requirements right with some specific uh, nature what should be the nature of HFF <coughs> excuse me so that V naught T so that is a question let me put it on the next page question. Or what class of filters H of F will V naught T V sub O T be proportional to the message signal? That is the question I would like to address. Okay. Okay. To do that. Is the question clear to all of you before we start answering it, before we start developing the answer for this question? <coughs> the question is you have some HFF here like the VSP filter right which has this kind of characteristics. So we know generally we want this filter to be having a gradual roll off but roll off can be designed in many different ways for example right. Will any roll off be permissible or will only certain kind of roll offs be permissible? Because otherwise uh, I, I do know that this kind of a filter is quite fine but is this fine for any kind of uh, roll off, any kind of gradual 
um, attenuation increasing attenuation right that is the basic issue we want to address what should be the constraint on the filter what should be the nature of the filter HF so that at the, if I at least do synchronous demodulation there should be no problem and V naught T should be equal to MT that is the question we are addressing. We do know one answer for example if there is no roll off if the perfect filter ideal cutoff filter will get P naught T equal to K times MT that is but there are that one answer is known but we want to develop a more general answer right and that is why you call it the general theory of sideband filter okay. To start doing that let us look at the spectrum of the modulated signal and we know that spectrum let me call this uh, MT into AC cosine 2 pi FCT I will denote this by U of T right. So then what is X of F? It is U of F into H of F and U of F I know is the spectrum of the modulated signal DSPSC signal right. So X of F would be equal to U of F into H of F which I know as equal to AC by 2 because U of F is AC by 2 into the message spectrum translated to FC plus the message spectrum translated to minus FC that into H of F that is the spectrum of your transmitted signal. What about the demodulated signal okay again at the demodulator I have called this the final output signal as V sub OT let me call this signal as V of T the signal at the output of this product modulator this mixer right. So what will be the spectrum of VT hmm? your V of a, so if I define V of T as AC prime cosine 2 pi FCT times XT which is what I am doing your V of F will be AC prime sorry AC prime by 2 into just the translation of this X of T the spectrum of uh, X of T so X of F minus FC plus X of F plus FC but X of F is given here so can I substitute that here how many terms will I get now 4 terms I will shift each of these 2 terms I will find out X of F minus FC I will get 2 terms find out F X of F plus FC you will get another 2 terms you will get 4 terms. So now out of these 4 terms can I identify the 2 terms first which will which will be in the base band because this is a band pass signal is not it this uh, uh, this V of T is a band pass signal uh, sorry it has your X of F is a band pass signal that is a modulated signal when you are trans doing frequency translation of that you will get a component translated <coughs> around the 0 frequency and a component translated around the <coughs> twice the carrier frequency so can we identify those uh, these two parts separately these four parts that this will have four terms that you will have here will contain two terms which will correspond to the base band component and two terms which correspond to the 2 fc component so let's first identify the base band components that will be ac into ac prime right because you are substituting for x of f minus fc from here upon 4 right what will be the base band part one component will come from hmm? when this becomes so if I shift it to by plus FC right you will get MF right and that will become HF plus FC and similarly from here if I shift it by minus FC so I will get MF into HF minus FC. So M of F will be common in these two terms and this will be H of F minus FC plus H of plus F plus FC is that clear these two terms 
what about the two uh, two fc terms same amplitude a sub c a sub c prime upon 4 so what will you get here you are shifting this to the right by fc right so this will become mf minus 2 fc so i don't think i'll have a common vector now <coughs> excuse me m of f minus 2 fc and what will be the corresponding h vector h of f minus fc plus m of f this will come from here <coughs> and we are shifting it to the left again by fc so this will become m of f plus 2 fc into h of f plus fc right please see this carefully and see that you are convinced so essentially what we are saying is this is the low frequency part of v of f and this is the high frequency part of v of f which will be centered around 2 fc and you can see that this this is obviously centered around 2 fc because m of f was a low frequency spectrum so you are shifting it to 2, 2 fc what about h f minus fc h f was centered around fc and you are shifting it further to the right by fc so it gets centered around 2 fc right so this is centered around 2 fc this is also centered around 2 fc and everything is centered around 2 fc whereas this part everything is centered around 0 okay if it is all, all right then i can proceed further so if i have that low pass now if i look at the output of the low pass filter in the demodulator what will i see so therefore v not f that is the output of the low pass filter which term will you see the first term first two terms right so you will get an output which is ac ac prime upon 4 into m of f into h of f plus fc plus h of f minus fc right that is what you will get and that provides the answer we are looking for right what do we want we want our v naught t to be proportional to mt k times mt right so what should be the what does that tell you what can we say about the filter hf what condition should it satisfy so that this happens hmm? this function of frequency which is coming from these two terms which are coming from the filter transfer function they should be equal to a constant value right they should not be a function of frequency right that is what it means that is the condition we are looking for that h f minus f c plus h f plus f c should be a constant let us for convenience call it twice h f uh, h f c because you know it does not matter what you call it it should be basically a constant and for convenience I am just saying that let that constant be equal to twice the value at f c right and if I specifically choose the response of h s the response of the filter transfer transfer function at f equal to f c to be let us say equal to half right then this condition becomes is equal to 1 basically I am choosing the constant to be equal to 1 arbitrarily right so the filter should be such that this condition is satisfied if you want that your demodulated output through synchronous demodulation actually is a replica of the message signal so we need to examine what this condition means right and also we like to also address the question still of what is the actual representation of the VSP signal like in the time domain. So these are the issues we will uh, continue in the next class thank you very much. <coughs>